guys and girls, welcome back to the ABS Grand Tournament. Uh, we're in for a treat. The last semi, uh, sorry, quarterfinals is um, will be happening in a few minutes. But before that, short announcement because we have a lot of new viewers. We broke the record from yesterday. Uh, we have now 37k people watching, which is really nice. And that's also nice for the host of the uh, of the of this tournament, which is abusgaming.com. Uh, basically, abusgaming.com is a site with a calendar, with an esports calendar, and a go to place when it comes to esports. You can check results and schedules for 10. Um, for 10 esports titles, including Smash Bros. recently, and you can also install Firefox and Chrome extensions for notifications so you don't have to browse anything and it will be just instantly notified by uh, Abius here. And that's really cool to think to see. Uh, I think it's like a really important, uh, important thing to add to your um, usual software you use because. There are so much things happening in esports right now. It's developing so fast with the amount of matches in every single game. And like an example, um, following the CS:GO scene and um, and Hearthstone scene, of course, there's a lot of stuff happening at the same time. So I don't have time to watch everything. How about you, Savo? Yeah, same. I mean, I've started getting in a little bit more. Um, primarily, the only esports scene that I was involved in, apart from Hearthstone, was fighting games, uh, which is a little bit separated from esports generally. But I've started to dabble in a, in a few other games. So uh, yeah, ABS Gaming definitely a, a resource that I can see myself getting a lot of usage out of. Cool. I know you are into the fighting scene, right? Yeah. So yeah. It's, was it Smash Bros? Or other it titles? wasn't. No, Smash is one of the few games that I don't play. Uh, Smash has recently sort of picked up and become a bit more esports uh, accepted mm -hmm. than the other fighting games. But um, things like like Street Fighter and Marvel vs. Capcom and Tekken and games like that, they're still kind yeah, of okay. their, their own community in terms of the fighting game community as a separate thing. They're not really that involved in the esports scene. It's, it's generally only like DreamHack where you see them cross over with each mm -hmm, other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, a uh, li little bit separated, but still ABS Gaming looks like a pretty excellent resource for uh, if you're fans of, of CSGO or StarCraft, League of Legends, Heroes of the Storm, anything like that. So. Dota, of course. Dota. Yeah. Anyway, all the stuff that we have to um, plan out for today is a giveaway, an ongoing giveaway with Battle.net gift cards and there are two ways of entering that giveaway. The easiest one and I think most entertaining one too is to tweet something about this tournament with a hashtag ABSGT and that makes you automatically um, a participant in the giveaway and also it's a given bonus with you know, you maybe will be featured on stream and anything that you say will be appearing on that stream. So that's a really cool thing. Uh, if you want a second way of um, just ha having a chance of, of winning something in this giveaway, you just type exclamation mark giveaway. And I see with my eyes of imagination that how, what's happening right now on Twitch chat after I say that exclamation mark giveaway. All the comments you can use are exclamation mark bracket, which gives you the link to the bracket of the tournament on abusgaming.com or the extension extensions, which gives you the information and links uh, about the Firefox and Chrome ex uh, extensions. If you want to know something about the tournament itself, type exclamation mark abusgt. And that's it. What can we say about those two participants? Um, Subtle, Kaldi and Stan Sivka. I think the big talking point here is uh, Stan Sivka's warrior deck that we saw played yesterday, um, mm -hmm, which includes mm -hmm. things like double Iron Beak Owl, double Bouncing Blade, double Death Lord, <laughs> yeah. um, just a card True Heart. It's almost like a fatigue style warrior deck that's looking to just like exhaust your opponent out of options. Yeah, that's um, a really cool deck. Yeah, so uh, I did really well for him yesterday in a in a handlock matchup. Um, I know Oskaka was slightly unhappy with the way that he he played that matchup. I think, um, but yeah, still Stan Sivka played that deck very very well. Nice to see some uh, some new kind of creative deck archetypes coming out here. So, Cowdy, from his perspective, he he got through yesterday, but he uh, he was uh, complaining that he wasn't feeling well yesterday. He was on a lot of pain mm -hmm. medication, was really mm -hmm. really under the weather. Um, actually spoke to him this morning before we came onto the cast. And uh, he said he's, he still has a bit of a fever, but he's feeling a little better and hopes he can he can play better today than he, he played yesterday. But yesterday was already good enough to see him through to the last eight. So if he's able to step it up, he has a good chance of getting through to the top four. And getting rid of that chunk of the prize pool, which is $5,000. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And um, oh, one important thing, because I totally forgot about it. And we had a lot of new viewers. 
if you want to see more tournaments happening on this channel, be sure to click the follow button because not only Hearthstone but all other games will be broadcasted on this brand new ABS TV channel. So be sure to click to click that follow button under the stream. And let's talk a little about the matchups. But before that, just wanted to say to the viewers that Stan Sivko was actually eating an apple <laughs> or a pear. I have not, not, I'm not exactly sure what was that, but he was eating on camera. So yeah. yeah. Um, the matchups. Kaldi has a Druid, Warlock and Warrior. Stan Sivka, Druid, Warlock and Warrior. But as you, as you were mentioning before, they're not usual decks. Right. Um, I think Cowdy's lineup is is fairly standard. I think we are looking at Patron, Handlock, and, and just double combo Druid, if I remember rightly from yesterday. But mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Stan Sivka does have that little twist with his Warrior deck. So it's not an exact mirror matchup. Uh, they are mirrored in terms of classes, but the, the choice of the decks is just a little bit different. Um, it looks like we are ready to get into game number one right now, and it is going to be Cowdy on Druid versus Stan Sifka looks like a warrior. It is. So it's the it's the really, really slow warrior deck against Druid. And uh, generally, Druid is favored against Control Warrior, but this isn't quite Control Warrior. Is there any cards that we saw in the deck yesterday that would help this deck be more competitive against Druid? I think that's um, like cards like an example, Death Lord, mm. might be a very big problem for Druid if he doesn't ramp up um, fast enough. Because if you can't follow it up, like let's say there's a turn for Death Lord and you couldn't uh, play a turn to Pallet Shredder mm -hmm. to like just deal the eight damage really fast, uh, the Death Lord might be a pro problem. At the same time, uh, the Death Lord dying is likely to have a decent amount of value for the for the Druid player, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. the deck is just packed full of like good drops from a from a. Uh... But then also like a big game hunter. There's also like That's an true. engine of war, which is only a five five. Yeah, druid of the claw, which will only be a four four uncharged. Yes, exactly. So yeah. And those, that minion dies to a single uh, single strike from death spite. Yep, that's very true. Um, so yeah, we see no on curve play here for Cowdy, but swipe to be mana efficient here, or um, is he valuing the the possible usage of Wrath to cycle later on? Or what's, what's the rationale here between swiping over just Wrathing and using your hero power? I'm thinking about it, because maybe Stan is thinking that this is a patron deck. Uh, sorry, Kaldi is thinking that this is a patron deck. He didn't do his like scouting. Mm. I, I, I'm, I'm really not the type of uh, of a dude that will say that because Kaldi is an analyst. Yes, so. absolutely. <laughs> but having, having said that, he probably did struggle just to summon the energy to play his tournament game yesterday with how rough he was feeling. So mm -hmm. after he won, he literally may have just gone to bed and Stan Sifka was the last game to be played of the yeah, so he might not have a chance case. to catch it maybe didn't have a chance to look at the vods so it's possible he doesn't know that he's playing against a, a control style warrior here but still swipe over wrath very interesting decision there but moving on stan sifka doesn't have an on curve play to make here either he has the option to coin out a sludge voucher just to get himself onto the board but looks like he's just going to chill sit back on his seat have a little munch on whatever that is he's eating and uh, have a nice long hard think about this turn Stan Sifka just never really seems to be in a rush to do anything, does he? Now he's the next life coach. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, you know, we are not necessarily sure what are the exact cards in Stan Sifka's deck. So maybe there's a lot of uh, choices you want to make based on what you have mm -hmm. available still, right? Yep, but still. I mean, if he doesn't Harrison Jones this fiery war axe, I think it's fairly safe he thinks he's playing against Patron, right? Mm -hmm. Because against Control Warrior, Death Bite isn't that much better than Fiery War Axe. It's still a really, really good weapon, but it's you don't have the you don't have the amazing, you know, destruction of the game plan that you do when you destroy Death Bite against Patron. So just drawing two cards here, you're basically playing an Ancient of Lore on turn five. Yep. Yeah. And that's super cool. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's a five mana engine of law, which only one HP less. There we go. All right, Harrison Jones cool. does come down. Uh, and now, uh, Sivka will be. I like the attack here. I like the attack here a lot. Do you? It yeah. dies to death spot. Yeah, I know, but uh, this is something I've started to do more, more and more recently with my mm -hmm. druid play. Is like, especially against a class like Warrior, where if you get overly greedy with your shade, it can just die to the brawl anyway. As soon as you have your second big minion consolidated on the board, 
if this thing just gets death bite, sure, you still have another five four on the board that's still pounding. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. So you know, I'm I'm pretty happy to to just get the value out of it when I can, as soon as I get a decent board presence built up. Mm -hmm. The Sylvanas was a no-brainer play here, but <laughs> oh god. Well, that's just devastating for Stance. Got the top deck keeper. I mean, there were a lot of chances of him having uh, the keeper anyway, right? So. The absolute toppest of decks. Keeper of the Grove, certainly going to be played. Yep. Uh, looks like he's going to cycle a Wrath first. Uh, Will he? Okay. Interesting. So it does look like he was valuing the cycle potential of the Wrath over the swipe, and that is the reasoning behind him keeping it. So that's very interesting. Um, but yeah, keeper has to come down here, right? There's, there's just has no to. way around it. This thing yeah. has to be keepered. And then and you ignore it, right? You just go face for 10 damage. Yeah, do you mind if it picks up the free trade on the Keeper of the Grove? Not, nah, not really. really. And I mean, I guess the risk is Brawl, right? Like, he has a 1 in 4 chance of a really blowout Brawl if you leave it alive, but he has to have drawn the Brawl, and then on top of that, he has to win in 1 in 4. It doesn't seem like that big of a risk, but yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I was almost sure that he's trading with the shade, right? Yeah, it looked like it. Garrett was doing it. And <laughs> my, that, my jaw that, dropped for a second. Yeah, that's never the play. You're definitely not trading with the shade. <laughs> trading with the Harrison, maybe we can justify, but the shade trade, no. Okay, and uh, now silence will have some value. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bash is a very cool card. Uh, when I was seeing, uh, when I was uh, watching the um, the previews for um, TGT. I said that Bash is almost the the best card in the set. I, I was really, so... really big on it when I first saw it as well, yeah. I, I didn't go that far, but I thought it was going to be a really nice, uh, flexible card to fit into. I mean, it will, it will get better if Patron will be, um, let's hope, nerfed, right? Because then probably the Control Warder will get back into the metagame and Bash will have will, will be just like a um, almost stable inclusion in, uh, in Control Warriors. Right. Uh, second keeper looks like a pretty solid draw here. There are things like Death Lords to worry about that he might have to silence if he wants to push through for a, for lethal, but otherwise, probably not too many silence targets left in the deck, right? Sylvanas is the big one that you kind of hear. Mm -hmm. I guess Belchers, same concern. You might have to silence them to push through for lethal, but the snipe here for two damage looks pretty solid. Hero power down the owl. Just keep beating away with the Harrison Jones for five to face. It's like a pretty solid game plan. Yep, definitely. And, um, hmm. Well, this matchup usually goes this way that, yeah, you just deal damage with the minions, finish it off with the combo. And the only way of Warrior making a comeback here is cards like Shield Slams and Shield Maidens. Justica helps a lot, but you, it's, it's time consuming a lot. Mm -hmm. So you need immediate uh, cards with immediate, um, immediate effect on the board. So Shields Maiden is better in this situation, but only if you pair it up with your Shields Sam. Yep. Generally, just a card is a card that you want to stabilize the board first before you start stabilizing your life total, because if you just try and play just a card onto a board like this, it's just such a low tempo play. You know, you invest six mana into a three health minion and then it gets Wrath down for two mana. The Druid just gets to gain four more mana's worth of tempo. Um, and, you know, the, the extra health you're gaining just doesn't really get anywhere. You have the Brawl to back up that sort of thing, which makes it slightly more effective. But, yeah, I like the uh, Shield Maiden here for the, mm -hmm, more, mm -hmm. the more competitive body than just a car, for sure. Yep. But the options for the Druid are not <laughs> limited at all. What do you think about just slamming the Emperor, Hero Power, trading with the 5-5, five five, and just going face with the Keeper? Um... I mean, so the only reason you're you're trading there is that you want to try and protect your emperor, right? Yes. Like give it give it an extra turn to potentially live. And um, you didn't see any weapons, any executes before. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like that play. I mean, I do also value the face damage extremely highly in this situation. When you're emperoring Force of Nature, Savage Raw, Swipe, and two Druid of the Claws, that's like an insane amount of burst you can put together over two turns as a follow up. Um, ooh, he's gonna go for the lower Theb here just to try and consolidate this board, make it really, really resistant to any removal, like a Brawl, like a Shield Slam, mm -hmm. like an Execute, mm -hmm. and then just mm -hmm. hope that he can push through with enough damage the turn after with Force of Nature hey, Savage Raw. That's actually good play. It puts yeah. up the lethal, almost certainly a lethal next turn. Right. But at the same time, Emperor allows you to use 
the combo for seven mana and you can pair it up with no you can okay never mind never mind yeah yeah, I mean, it's basically like the break point there is the decision between playing the long game with like the long term emperor value that lets you stack up a bunch of damage over the next two or three turns. Whereas Cowdy's option here is just flipping the skill, the kill switch this turn and just saying, yeah. okay, I'm not messing about, I'm just going to kill you next turn. And the lower fair bit denies removal, but it also denies things like shield block that he could use to get out of range. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it seems like a, a pretty solid line of play here from Cowdy. Well, if you would play Emperor, you can deal 18 damage from hand next turn, which is also nice. Can you? Yeah, it's because you can play a combo with Swipe. Uh, no, that's 10 mana. He'd only have 9. Oh, yeah, sorry. Right? Oh, yeah. Never mind. Anyway. Yeah. What I'm talking about. Chat will just destroy me right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Twitch chat has to have their victory occasionally, right? If yeah, they get yeah. to catch our mistakes every now and again, good for them. We did it, Reddit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that is just gonna be lethal. Sifka, Sifka just goes with the armor up play. I don't think Belcher was enough to protect him anyway. Cowdy gonna play the top decks out of Force of Nature just for a bit of tilt potential, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't think Stif Sifka was paying any attention to where that card came from. Uh, he didn't. Like, and, like, this is the matchup which you usually lose to, so I don't think that's a problem. Yep, absolutely. So Force of Nature, Savage Raw sealing the game as many games have been sealed and uh, Cowdy going off to a 1-0 lead, looking very strong in this tournament so far, um, despite the, the little bit of a health problem that he's having. So congratulations to him. I hope he can keep it up and get through to the top four for his sake. Tempo Storm is on tech. Right, and so the, <laughs> the, the, the big powerhouse teams are performing really well in this tournament so far, right? Arkham. Well, got result. Archon has two players through, uh, Nihilum has a player through. Uh, sorry, okay, pronounce Nihilum for me. Just so Nihilum. I... Nihilum, okay, cool. Yeah. I, will, I won't it's... get that wrong anymore. It's like a Latin word. It's, okay. it's, it's actually a Latin word. It means okay. nothing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Nihilum uh, has a player through, Archon has two, and uh, Cowdy in a good spot to join them as a Tempo Storm representative as well. So like the big Hearthstone organizations are, are doing pretty well in this tournament so far. Mm-hmm. And now the next matchup, uh, probably, what do you think? What will be, well, what it will be? Because uh, Kaldi has still a warlock and warrior in his, in his arsenal, mm -hmm. and you probably don't want to queue up a handlock into Stansifka's warrior. And as we talked yesterday, most of the players want to stick to their guns when it comes to conquest, right? Yeah. So they usually stick with the with the deck they were playing um, the last round if right. they lose the uh, if they lose it. Right. So, yeah. And it's hard to say. Like, there's a certain like element of pride to that. Of like, I lost with this deck. I want to recover. I want to show that this deck's good. But also, there's just the thing of like, yeah. you picked that deck first for a reason. Like, that's the deck that you wanted to win with first. So that doesn't change after the first loss. You still want to win with that deck first. So it kind of makes a lot of sense that the that the it generally does happen that way and that people mm -hmm, tend to queue mm -hmm. up the same thing, but that is something that can be exploited by your opponent if you fall into that habit too consistently. Yep, that's a good point. Uh, but we'll see in a second if Stan Sivka will actually use the, the warrior for a second time. Nope, he switches to Warlock. So it's going to be Cowdy on the warrior this time as the patron player, and mm -hmm. Stan Sivka picks up the strong matchup as the handlock. Yeah. There was one inclusion in Sansifka's deck that we actually see in the opening hand that I just want to talk about. Alex Straza was an inclusion in Handlock like a one year ago. Oh, and Ring Farseer as well. Speaking of one year ago. Yeah, it actually looks like a deck from one year ago. That's a really odd unless you, list, you, right? Yeah, un uh, unless you cut out the hell the Hillbot, right? Yeah. It's a new inclusion. But um, it looks really, really different from what we see usually from um, Handlock's decks in general. I mean, Earthen Ring Farseer is a card that I kind of miss in Handlock sometimes because there's just those situations where you get your 8-8 down at the start of the game um, and then you're under enough pressure that your 8-8 is kind of forced to trade on the board. You can't just slam face with it. And then in that situation, the Earthen Ring Farseer is such a nice follow-up. If you just get to trade into like a 4-attack minion or a 3-attack minion and then heal it back up with the Farseer and just retain mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. the full value of your giant, that's so potentially game-winning that I do find myself like reminiscing about the days when Farseer was in the deck, but Handlock is such yeah. a tight deck in terms of cards that they want to play, that finding room for things like Earthen Ring Farseer is uh, is kind of tricky to me. Already one giant and Twilight Drake in hand. Mm hmm. Hmm. That's a lot of threats, and I think Sansifka will follow it up with a Twilight Drake. 
then tin five would be a tap into giant. Um, yeah, I was just about to ask how you feel about the threat ordering in this matchup because normally that like that's the the general conventional wisdom like you play the Drake first because then you get to tap giant the next turn. Um, but against Patron Warrior, that lines up really, really terribly against Death Spite because if you play Twilight Drake, they equip Death Spite, they swing into your Twilight Drake, so the Drake then has five health remaining, and then the turn after you play a Mountain Giant, and then mm -hmm. they swing the Death Spite again into the Twilight Drake. Do the five damage to kill that the whirlwind effect goes off and then they have the execute just to take down your your mountain giant um, okay so i almost like playing the mountain giant first in this matchup and just literally demanding the execute straight away um just to re like remove that real blowout possibility but stan sifka gone down a different line entirely and decide to really value denying the cards from his opponent with the iron body count yeah that's a completely different type of uh, play than just putting out a threat on board because mm -hmm. how you want to play against patrons usually is to just pressure them enough to kill them before they kill you yeah and it sounds like you know like basics of sounds, it sounds easy day. right yeah just it sounds easy them. and like basic of every single deck you kill them before they kill you uh but it's like uh, i think it's one of the uh it's like one of the uh, the only way of uh, winning against patrons you have to pressure them enough <laughs> It's not about like sustaining uh, the damage from them because if they draw the whole deck, they possibly just will <laughs> swipe from the uh, face of the air. Uh, I like the coin. Wow, he's gonna cycle both wow. battle rages just for one card each. That does surprise me. Uh, I like the coin acolyte there quite a lot myself. Um, you know, Stan Sifka went to the ends of the earth. I mean, it sounds weird, right? All he did was play an owl, but he really did like. If you make some um, a handlock do something on turn four that isn't play a massive threat, that's a huge commitment for them. So if he if he's that scared of raw acolytes on the board, I don't mind just coining out another raw acolyte and saying, well, okay, how do you want to deal with this one? Yep. At the same time, you asked me about the threat ordering, right? Mm -hmm. And what, how do you feel about that if uh, most of the warriors are playing shield block shield slam? Mm. Because usually when when we are thinking about a matchup, let's say. Handlock against Warrior Control. They usually want to start first with the Twilight Dragon because it chips off the armor before you can use the Shield Slam uh, to like a you know value at all. Yep, no, that's a really good point. Um, but yeah, it's one of the things about Hearthstone, right? There's all these little tiny nuances, and it's a it's a very simplistic game at its core. It doesn't have any like in-depth crazy mechanics or anything like that. All the cards are quite simple in comparison to something like Magic the Gathering. Mm -hmm. But there's there's little nuances like the things that we keep talking about over this cast that do make this game just incredibly complex to play at a really high level. I mean the 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 interesting thing about Hearthstone is that a small misstep mm. might lead to an instant defeat. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely. very interesting. It's very um Hearthstone is uh punishing, very punishing yes. when you compare it to other card games. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, second slam picked up here. This is very much just a cycle matchup. And with this hand, uh, he has a War uh, sorry, a Frothing Berserker and a Grim Patron already. Mm -hmm. um, so he, I like him to find some way to cycle here. He's going with the Acolyte in a rage, which I think is totally fine. It's more mana efficient than using the slam overall. Um, and yeah, he's just going to try and pick up as many cards as he can. Yep. The way you play a patron deck against a handlock is usually you want to kill them with the Frothing Berserkers because the patrons are the the objective of the patrons in this matchup is usually to just um, trade with minions yeah. before you go with the Frothing Berserkers to the face, mm -hmm. or uh, you just use them as defense line when you're being threatened by a, uh, by a lethal from your opponent. Yeah, and that's the reason behind that is the fact that. Um, uh, that the handlocks are just sporting two hellfires and a shadow flame, you know, just kill them after you spam the board. So that's not really a, a big of a deal for the handlock to deal with. Yeah, the other usage of uh, patrons in this sort of matchup that's been ruled out by the way that Cowdies play the early game turns is sometimes you'll use them on sort of turn eight, turn nine, uh, with maybe one in a rage and one whirlwind, just in order to cycle a battle rage for uh, for several cards. But mm -hmm. since Caldi's mm -hmm. used his battle rage, uh, both his battle rages early just to draw one card each, uh, he's not going to have that option available to him. So yeah, Grim Patrons will probably be reserved for a, a board clearing tool, just to clear the clear the way to set up for a lethal on the following turn with the Frothing Berserker. 
But yep. before, before we get to any of that, he has to find two very crucial cards, Warsong Commander and Emperor Thorasan, which are both borderline essential in terms of putting together a combo that will uh, get through a Handlock's defenses with the amount of taunts they can put into play. Definitely. Speaking of Emperor, there is an Emperor Thorasan, but unfortunately for Cowdy, it's on Stan Sifka's side of the board. <laughs> And now this makes a really awkward board for uh, for Kaldi. You have to deal with those minions with the weapons. You don't exactly want to do this. Uh, still missing the crucial crucial card, which is, as Ren would say, two Warzone Commanders and 28 random cards in yeah. the deck. So you need that Warzone Commander in your hand. So I guess he's just evaluating any possible lethals here. If he's been keeping track, you'll know his opponent still has the coin. Um, so he does have some options available to burst without uh, access to Emperor Thorasan, but I think the Emperor here is totally safe to put on this board. I don't think you're under any threat of dying in the near future. Hmm. Well, what do you want to do as uh, as Kaldi? On, on the cycle, right? That's your only play. Yep. Cycle, just take for the Emperor. Yeah. But he's he staring at. Executes. 14 damage from his opponent here. Yeah, and usually you'll just see a Hellfire or or a Dark Bomb, and that's it. Maybe Defender of Argus even, that's enough. Yep. Uh, if he chooses not to armor up, then Defender of Argus is indeed just lethal on its own. Um, but the Taunt is enough to prevent that. The Taunt will also do a little job of softening up these minions so that they can be cleared more easily on a later turn. It'll take care of the Ancient Watcher to remove one of the Taunts from the board. Um, but uh, sh this is just you can the shadow, right. flame shadow flame and, the ancient and torture. Yeah, that adds free free health to nineteen, and then you have. Uh, oh no! Because you only just have four, nine, twelve, fourteen, six in damage. That's three yeah, off. It's three off. Sorry, I was uh, distracted by you um, talking about the hellfire. I was imagining. It, <laughs> yeah, I was imagining he had it in hand, but he doesn't. So. Still a little bit short, but he can make a big push here. He can play lower Theb to deny any sort of nonsense happening the next turn. It looks like he'll just set up lethal for the, for the following turn. And that Definitely is, Lotheb is a good play here. Exactly what he's going for. And another tick from the Emperor doesn't really matter, but makes it impressive, like 70 mana like Straza. Mm -hmm. well and that's it. Kaldi will probably just concede this turn. Yep, Cowdy gives over the world played, and it looks like he's going to go with the, the honorable route of buffing the Twilight Drake and killing himself with the Death Spike. No, he can't even play the coin. Nope. Denied coin value feels bad, man. So it's honorable Mitsubishi, mm, played by Cowdy. <laughs> and that means the game is tied up 1 1. Uh, Handlock is secured for Stan Sivka. Uh, that's not really a big issue because uh, Head Droid is, all <laughs> is already out of the way. Yep. And next matchups uh, are left Droid and Warrior for Stan Sivka, Warlock and Warrior for Kaldi. So nothing changed there. there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not exactly sure, I can't remember, if Stan Sivka is playing any weapon removals in his Droid. Uh, no, I don't remember specifically either. We saw a lot of druids. I think almost every player at this point has has druid in their lineup. So mm -hmm. but hard, hard was, to remember everyone's specific yeah. builds. But it's worth mentioning that in this tournament we see a lot of variety. Variety. Yeah, when it comes absolutely. To deck building. Yeah, we've seen some priests. We've seen some rogue. We've seen some shaman. We've seen uh, you know even even in the common classes we've seen a lot of variation. Uh, Hoy was playing things like Grand Grand Crusader in Paladin. We've seen. Uh, Direwolves and Abusive Sergeants in just normal mid-range Paladin. We've seen Sifka's crazy warrior deck, so there has been a, a lot of uh, pretty nice, exciting stuff here, but speaking of exciting, Innovate Shade into Coin Shade is pretty exciting if you are specifically the person playing Druid. Mm -hmm. if, you're, <laughs> if you're anyone else, <laughs> not quite so exciting, but yeah, as the Druid player, it feels pretty good. Feels good, man. We've seen this situation before, right? You talked about it at the start yeah. of the broadcast. Uh, Ekop got the two shades down early and then just drew a timely Savage Raw to... Two, 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 two Savage, savage Raw. <laughs> to just close out the game on something like turn six or whatever it was. So, yeah, this is the thing that can happen. Um, and uh, in this situation... I talked with this about... Uh, about um, I talked about this with Life Coach and he said to me that the Shadow of Extremis is one of the most important cards in this Whoa. matchup. 
Wait, what? Whoa! Why don't you call out the second shade of next ramp? I have no situation. idea. So by the time Hellfire can happen, which is next turn, your first shade will have grown to four full. So you are fine against Hellfire. Yes. Um. So I. Yeah. I. And like, it's not like. Okay, he just top deck Lurther, so now what I'm about to say is complete nonsense. But at the time when he did it, it wasn't like his curve was three drop, coin five drop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, he did. But just there was a huge chance that he would draw them, right? There is a very good chance he'll draw a five drop, yeah, because it is a very heavy mana slot in the Druid deck. You do play a, a large amount of fives, but Ooh. at the same time, just getting the extra shade down there earlier just seems like a really strong play. I don't know. But now we have to drop the low tap on Q, right? Otherwise, you're kind of being held in your tracks. If you play low tap, your opponent can't use Shadow Flame. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're worried about the most. I mean, if, if your opponent has Shadow Flame, you lose your both uh, both Shadow Max Rams, which are extremely important because they can outgrow the Giants and seal the game by themselves. Right. The other option, of course, is to play Lurtheb and feel safe that you can attack with your shades and actually deal the eight. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's an option because he's, he can't play Dark Bomb, he can't play Shadow Flame. The only thing he can play is Owl, and that only deals with one of them. Um, the Mountain Giant does then pick up the trade on the other one, but then you have a reasonably nice trade back into it with Swipe, and you just retain the mm -hmm. Lurtheb on the board. So I think there's definitely some merit to attacking, but I also agree with you that just having the shades grow to, to the immortal size where they can't be giant shadow flamed is really, really important in this matchup. So, mm -hmm. But you have to find a way to deal with the giants and the threats from your opponent. Yes. And if those cards are basically just waiting um, when they will just outgrow everything, then you just sacrifice two cards as a late win game conditions. Mm -hmm. With no impact on board, and that's something Druid doesn't want to do. Yep, absolutely. Um, so we're going to see second Mountain Giant here. A lot of pressure building up on this. Big Game Hunter! Uh, nope. Uh, Innovate, oh, Innovate Ancient of Lore is pretty nice, though. Yeah, it is nice, but then you have to sacrifice one of the shades for the 8 3 Giant. Because you can. If you play the low tip, your plan was to play around Shadow Flame, and if you can't play around it next turn. You're doing something wrong. Right. So I guess you need to play the Ancient of Law, draw cards, seek for that big game hunter, and search for that big game hunter, sorry, and um, just you. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm just gonna use the swipe. I like keeping the swipe against Handlock because that's. Uh, I talked about it a lot. Y you can use the swipe as a reach card mm. to finish off the game. Right. And there's a Shadow Flame. There is a Shadow Flame, that's a really important draw. So he's he's won the race, which is basically drawing the Shadow Flame before one of these shades reaches nine health. Uh, he did still have a few turns left to do it, but allows him to deny all the value from these shades now, and they will have just been uh, you know six mana invested for essentially nothing. These cards have done nothing this turn except to, to trade for a, a Mountain Giant and a Shadow Flame, which sounds okay, you know, it's a, it's a two for two trade, but in terms of the Druid game plan, Having these shades stealth the whole time has not in, in advanced their win condition at all. So, yeah, that's a good point you brought up. I mean, the two for two trade is a is a good trade. It's not bad at all. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you lose your win conditions. Yeah, and there was I suppose there was also an innovate used on one of these shades, so it's technically a two for three. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Ooh. Oh. Okay, I, I kind of like it. Because your opponent will not use those shades unless he has double Savage Roars. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you'll get punished really, really hard by a big game hunter, but you know that you're just playing around a top deck at that point, because big game hunter, there's no way that it's in his hand right now with that giant surviving on the board for so long, with two giants surviving on the board for so long, in fact. Um, yeah. But, you know, you do give up a lot of Shadow Flame potential here, but this is a. This is a really strong play in terms of tempo. It puts out the biggest board when you consider that 3-4 is 3-4, Death Rattle, Summon a 5-7. Um, this is actually an enormous board that uh, that Stan Sivka has to find some sort of answer to here. It's a really hard, hard decision right now. Your Ancient of has to wait one turn because it's too... If you didn't play it on the turn before, you want to play it right now, even if you trade with both minions. Mm. 
Or is it both tones, right? Hmm. All right, Sifka so gonna go ahead and silence the. Uh... Oh, he's oh, gonna so... swipe it. Wait, wait, wait. So if he's going to swipe that, how do you trade? You don't he trade doesn't. at all. Yeah, if he's swiping, he's leaving them stealth. Yeah, oh. absolutely. And this will get punished by and the shadow now, flame. And now the greed with the shadow flame from Cowdy pays off because he gets to pick up another minion a lot with the with the shadow flame, and it's now just a much more attractive option. And I think that's the last call when it comes to shadow flame. Because the, the shadow will be 8-8 eight, eight next turn. Mm -hmm. And your giant will most likely die. So many yep. Especially because next turn the 6-6 six, six shade can just trade with the giant and he can still retain the bigger one. So, you know, he has the option to just remove the giant next turn and still keep his enormous shade stealthed. Um, so, yeah, I'd be very, very surprised if we don't see the shadow flame get used this turn. And it looks like that is what we are going to see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that also just, uh, does it set up lethal for next turn? Not quite. He's a little bit short. He has eight damage from his hand with the Doom Guard and the, uh, the Dart Bomb. Yep. So, not quite Ooh. there yet. There's the Sever Drawer. That is a good In the Force of Nature. Yep. But you are getting really, really low against the Handlock. And this is like, um, change of pace when it comes to the, uh, to the how the matchup usually looks. Mm -hmm. Solely because of the fact that now handlocks have Doomguard available. Right. Yeah, it's it's something, you know, back in the day when Handlock used to play like the Leroy Jenkins faceless combo. Oh, yeah, that was um, ridiculous. Yeah, and it, you know, you actually had to play around dying all the time against Handlock as well as trying to set up enough pressure to be able to stop them just walling you out with huge minions. So adding a Doomguard back into the deck isn't quite that level of insanity, but it does still give you that additional concern where you do have to worry about dying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So now when you call the, what you gonna do? Well, as I said, Mortal Coil, just one, always one of the most attractive cards to a handlock player. Four damage to the face. Oh, okay. So now this makes, he has to play taunts. I mean, he was, uh, he, he wanted to play those taunts anyway. Yeah. He's but... really digging for a big game hunter here with the Mortal Coil. Doesn't find it. Three more to face. Seven oh, wow. damage from Boombots this turn. So how does the pair up with the taunts now? Is he dead? He doesn't have a heal bot, right? So he, he has a two two mana, uh, sorry, one mana Sunfury Protector. Yeah, and so he can make several large taunts this turn if he wants to. He certainly has to. He has one mana Molten, he has a 4 9 Drake, and then he can wall those up with the Defender of Argus if he wants to. Mm hmm, mm hmm. Um, and he, if he really wants to go all in, he can give taunt to the uh, Emperor, Emperor as too. well. Yeah, all right. I like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, this setup's easy lethal for him next turn. Yeah. If he doesn't die this turn, and three taunts is something you can't really, like, you can't really trade with everything here. Yep. Um, next so you die next turn. Yeah. Next turn, he just has eight anyway. So like, Stansifka would have to clear this entire board and armor up. Because uh, he just has Jaraxxus Doomguard from his hand next turn, as crazy as that is. Yeah. Emperor Thorasan does things to this game, Lothar. <laughs> does silly things like letting you play a 5-7 charge and one of the most broken cards in the same turn. I mean, now Doom, the, the Doomguard doesn't seem so great in general. But at, at some point of the game, I was thinking, like, Doomguard is too powerful. Like, when Zoo was at the top of the food chain, I just thought that Doomguard might be too powerful, and I was thinking about maybe, ch like, a change it to it with right. a free fight stats and additional buffs for the cards being discarded would be cool. Like, you know, you get a plus one, plus one for each card being discarded. Oh, okay, you're right, okay. So right. In, in, the, in the dream situation where it discards yeah. nothing, it's just not that powerful. It's just a... 3-5 charge, which is still cool, okay? Right. Yeah, there. that yeah. makes that makes some sense. Yeah, but uh, anyway, in the meantime, Stansivka eats a banana and wins, um, sorry, uh, loses the game to Kaldi's handlock. So it's 2-1 for Kaldi, and Kaldi is left with his warrior, which is, if I recall correctly, a patron deck. Yep. Um, so yeah, Kaldi still has to pick up one win out of two. With, uh, with Patron Warrior, which is generally a thing that you'll feel favored doing. Um, mm -hmm. But he does have to get through this very, 
very, very sustain heavy, uh, you know, life gain heavy, removal heavy warrior decks. This looks With like a Doom Death Lords. Death Lords, exactly. And Death Lords are really, really powerful against Grim. Oh yeah. They are, because they can put out a Warzone Commander exactly. on board just just to kill those. Right. A Throtting Berserker just to kill it with Death Spite or whatever you have on board or in hand. Right. So they're definitely cool in this matchup. It's a little counterintuitive because people might think, oh, you're put, you're playing a 2-8 minion? Well, they just Warzone patron it and then they just generate a massive board of patrons. But, you know, at that point... They're going to pull another valuable minion out of their deck. Might be something like a Frothing Berserker. It might be something like the second Warsong Commander. It might be something like the second Grim Patron. And then as the Warrior, you can just brawl that entire board away. And they've lost so much value and so many resources from their deck that they're probably just lacking in what they need to kill you at that point. So, hmm. There's a Shield Block, Shield Block, Brawl, and Low Tab in the Stun Stiff, because open hand. Uh, Sludge Belcher. Uh, sorry, yeah, Sludge Belcher. Mm -hmm. Um... I would say it's not bad. You know your opponent is playing, uh, will be playing a slow deck. Yep. So there will be no pressure at all. So you can cycle, you can just play your game. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily worry about the situation. Uh, Cowdy chooses not to play the armor smith on turn two. Um, normally when you do that, it's kind of from fear of Acolyte, but he did have the coin death spite just to clear out an Acolyte if it was played in response. So. Um, I would have been okay with the armor smith play there, just to put something on the board to start pecking away, but no real harm in just passing and armoring up either. Mm-hmm. Uh, Acolyte of Pain being picked up. I mean, uh, one of the important cards in this matchup might be the Justica True Heart. Yes! Uh, Justica is pretty much just a win condition on its own against mm -hmm. Patron Warrior, mm -hmm. because you can basically play that, and then the Patron is forced to remove it, because six damage a turn is too much to start taking a beating from every turn. And then once they've removed that from the board, you actually don't have to play a card ever again. <laughs> you can it's you, hilarious, right? Yeah, you can just press armor up and, you know, gaining two armor a turn, normally you're not going to get out of range of the amount of damage Patron can do, which is, you know, 60 plus if they've Emperored a good hand. But gaining four armor a turn, you can get out of range of that pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, just a card coming down in the late game and then just never seeing another card being played is actually a pretty viable win condition against Patron Warrior. That's true. But um, as a Sivka now, do you want to just slam that? Yes, I would, right. yeah. I would for sure shield slam that, yeah, absolutely. Because why would you keep, that, keep those slams with the amount of removal you have in your deck? Right. I mean, two of his removal cards are Bouncing Blades, which are not the most efficient ways to remove Grim Patrons, let's say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, he does have the Brawl as the ultimate fallback option in his hand, so denying the card draw from the Acolyte of Pain seems pretty reasonable that turn. Well, he did give him one draw, right? But it's not that yeah. big of a deal. Well, yeah, yeah, it's basically a country. Right. Denying things like, you know, Cruel Taskmaster, Whirlwind into Battle Rage or some some nonsense like that happening where, you know, the Grim Pageant can really get rolling with the with the card draw. Yeah. Kaldi keeping his cool. He's not even blinking. Um, <laughs> do you go for the Patron's turn here? Um... You can coin out Whirlwind, but... I mean, you're sure that your opponent will have means to deal with those, but if as the game progresses, there's no chance you can sustain a board no. against this warrior. So, um, if you want to like take some take a leap of leap of faith here, you would well, you would like to drop patrons right right now. Right, and with no weapon equipped, as long as um, like three out of five scenarios, right you're going to have a patron remain on the board that you can continue to generate more patrons with later. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, because there's no weapon equipped, there's only six mana, so unless there is another spell like Execute or uh, another Shield Slam to follow up the Brawl, you will still retain a patron afterwards. Um, yeah, so I absolutely don't blame him for going for this option here. Uh, if he didn't choose to do it this turn, you can only assume that he's planning to hold it all the way for the, the final burst push alongside uh, Frothing Berserkers and things like that. So yep, Sifka is forced to brawl here, and he's going to hope for a damaged patron to be the one that survives. Or just his minion. Oh, oh yeah, that. I mean, that works. How convenient. Yeah, that works <laughs> perfectly fine. Uh, you, OK, 
Okay, so I don't know about you, Lothar, but I think under no circumstances can you possibly emperor this hand against. No, 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 no. You need more parts. You yep. need more parts for the combo. Armor Smith is basically useless in this matchup. Yeah. So what you need is just cycle that battle rage, cycle that slam before you slam the emperor and board. Absolutely, but Dog to Boom coming down now, so this game is going to start to accelerate, and the uh, patron, the patron warrior, is not going to have all the time in the world to, to pick up the options he needs. Yeah, but he has the option of cycling now a lot of cards and slamming down the emperor. I mean, sorry, there's there's not an option to play the battle rage this turn. Okay, he's going to hope that to both of his minions live here. Perfect. Yeah. So a three-card battle rage will come down now. And he's going to look for more high value cards like Patron, like Frothing Berserker, like additional Whirlwind effects uh, come into his hand. All right, there's another Whirlwind effect. Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. For the next turn. Now we should use the Slam to cycle more. Yep. You can think about even playing the Taskmaster this turn. Uh... I mean, you just want to put more minions on board, maybe deal a small amount of damage. Yeah, seems reasonable. Hmm. At the same time, Death Spite, if this board gets cleared, Death Spite plus Taskmaster is like an emergency clear for the Doctor Boom next turn. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, that's yeah, a good so, point. so I can I can understand holding on to it. But he he does still have the inner rage, but the inner rage is much more valuable to use in your uh, in your your eventual burst combo because it you know, it fits in. Although the Taskmaster will probably cost one because you're gonna Emperor it. You know, the difference between one and zero, which is what the inner rage would cost, is pretty massive, so Mm -hmm. Certainly don't blame him for holding on to it there, but now the uh, the tanking up begins and uh, Cowdy is going to know that he has his work cut out for in this game and he is going to have to burst through an absolute massive life total at some point. Now the only way of um, Cowdy winning this game is hitting like a double throating berserker with insane amount of damage. Yep. And he has the option to do that and he's not being threatened to like be killed super fast mm -hmm. so i like that he uses the weapon i mean the uh, the um the fear works will only deal three damage because i would like him uh to use uh the death spite next turn before the attack before the second attack with the fear war axe mm -hmm. hmm. all right second brawl comes into the hand well the second brawl is not that important as the first one no absolutely it's probably not just useless the only the only way this becomes useful is that um we do see cowdy has both war songs in his hand so if he decides to try and split up his lethal over two turns and do mm -hmm. one one turn with uh you know war song and patron and then use war song and double frothings as the second follow-up burst he does have the brawl to to clear out and potentially have enough mana left over to gain some more armor or play a sludge belcher or something like that so it could be useful in some fringe scenarios but definitely agree that the first brawl is the crucial one in this matchup so he has three uh wound effects available and he can fill the board because he has two four six seven eight ten mana with five minions mm -hmm. six minions on board mm -hmm. wow that's really a lot i'm not exactly sure how much damage will it be Oh, he only has one frothing right now, which is the problem. Yeah, but one frothing is still might be okay. He might reach ab Three, about the 20, 40 damage, 20, I would say. 30. Yeah, it's 40-ish, yeah. Hmm. Um, but still a little bit short. Uh, is he going to use the inner rage here? Ah, oh, will he? Well, he can't really squeeze more parts into the combo, right? Mm. Because that's 6, 7, 8 mana, 9 mana. He can squeeze one more whirlwind, but that doesn't really do anything. All right, so this turn from Stan Sivka will just be gain nine armor, um, trade with the shield maiden on the board. Uh, my, I might use the fiery war axe instead. Uh, now he's going to use bash and gain even more armor. Don't blame him at all. Yeah, um, you can't play more minions because you might die. Exactly. The one thing, <laughs> the one thing that's not happening is more minions being placed on this board. And I think this fiery war axe might as well just swing face as well. No, nope, he's going to hold on to it. Okay. Execute. Uh, yeah. I mean, now Kaldi wants Stan to actually play more minions. Yeah. Uh, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six playable minions this turn. Six playable minions with uh, seven, seven damage whirlwind effect, right? So that's 21. Three whirlwinds that go, yeah. So that's 20 but... damage in whirlwinds. Four... No, no, sorry, 20 because your taskmaster dies after the second whirlwind. Yes, okay. Um... 
Uh, that's clearly not enough because that's not even the whole armor. Yeah, that's 24. Then you get two extra from the unstable ghoul trades. So it's 26. But then you're losing one of the unstable ghouls for one of the whirlwinds as well. So it's 25. So yeah, he's 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 struggling to break 30 at the moment without an additional um, power. Berserker. Yeah, additional power minion, something like a patron or a, a frothing berserker. If he picks up the second, if he picks up patron, we probably will see him go for the like split over two turns strategy if he picks mm -hmm, up the mm -hmm. frothing then it's more likely that he uh he holds on and tries to do it all in one go because obviously drawing the second frothing doubles the amount of damage you're doing that's true but at the same time sivka might just not play any minion at all and just pure power up every single turn yeah this is this is exactly what i talked about at the start of the game like hero power mm -hmm. pass is your win condition now just yep it, that's very true like okay people People understand the idea of like, okay, the less minions I have on board, the less damage he can do. But the really, really important thing is if you have exactly zero minions, then you're really limiting the amount of damage they can do because they you give them nothing to pop unstable ghouls on. So their, their amount of damage goes down dramatically unless they're able to do three whirlwind effects. And if they can do three whirlwind effects, the unstable ghoul is going to burst and then it will just kill the frothing berserker because that will be the fourth whirlwind effect. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah, bad things happen. But he is going to choose to play a shield maiden here, which I do not agree with. That that shield maiden almost certainly deals more than five damage to you. Yes, because the two unstable goals can be popped, yeah. and um, the shield maiden adds itself at um, at least three damage from the whirlwind's effect, yep. and two damage from four damage from the unstable goals. So yeah, I, I, even though it looks attractive just to gain even more health and go up to 69 here, I think the um, the usage of the Shield Maiden is actually making it marginally more likely that mm -hmm. Kaldi is able to win this game. And now a Patron appears in the hand, so it might be viable to use the first wave of Patrons to deal some damage, ignore the board. I would 100% Bouncing Blades my own Shield Maiden right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking. That's the play. You you bouncing blades your own shield maiden. Bouncing blades is an appalling card in this matchup. What are you using it for? Just get that thing off the board so the unstable ghouls can't be popped. That is 100% the play. I'm dead serious. I think that's actually genuinely a mistake that he didn't do that. Okay, I believe you. And <laughs> uh, now what do we do? Uh, I mean, you have to go with some damage. Yep. You can wait. You, yep. you have to do damage. So you play the first war song, and now you have to use the patron. Use one patron already, so this is your last call. Mm -hmm. And I'm not exactly sure how much whirlwind effects are left in the deck. Mm. Uh, no, I haven't quite been keeping track either. I think he used one, possibly, with an Akai at some point. I think point. he was one with the uh, patron turn. Right, yeah, yeah, that's what it was, yeah, because he did Death's Bite, Patron, Whirlwind, yeah. So one of the natural Whirlwinds is gone from the deck. Um, so I think just Warsong, Inner Rage, Patron is the play here. We've just been told that Cowdy only has four cards left in his deck, so he is one in four to top deck the second Frothing Berserker next turn. Um, so he will be trying to do some really frantic maths here about, whoa, you have to oh, play I don't You have to play you have to oh. I don't agree with that at all. You have to deal damage right now. Yeah, I agree. I 100% agree. And... Oh! Whoa! Oh. There didn't count the cards in the hand. Yeah, no, that's why I was reacting, because he didn't play anything. So he had like he had to he had to make a play that turn, because he was going to... Okay, I was just about... Only about the damage, no? Right. Now, this turn doesn't... It, it's not different at all from the previous turn. No. Just the fact that you your opponent gained full armor and you burned a very important card. Yeah, I mean, it's probably secondary only to the second Frothing Berserker in the deck in terms of important cards that he has left. Uh, yep. He's, he's going to use both Inner Rages here. Uh, uh, I don't agree with using the second Unstable Uh Yeah, I think you should almost certainly only use one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is fine. I mean, maybe it's okay because it's nine damage for one one unstable goal. Yeah, you also you also have to hold the death spire as well. Yes, you you have to. Um, oh, what would you trade? Trade it up with a five one as well. Uh, but you can't trade. You need that minion on board for the next ten unstable goals. Well, he needed. To, I guess he was wanted to make some space on the board because obviously overfilling the board makes it more likely your opponent's able to clear. But still. 
Eh. I don't know about trading with the 5-1 over uh, the 3-2. Obviously keeping your healthy patrons is important, but I think 3-2 over the 5-1 might have been the option there. Um, so, healthy patron survives, but it doesn't matter because we have the weapon equipped anyway to chop it down, and we are going to stay pretty comfortable at 61 life this turn after a, a full double in a rage unstable ghoul warsong combo. So. Yeah, that's not impressive at all. Okay, hey, ben Brother was right. Deck is not impressive at all. No. <laughs> Terrible win rate in tournament, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this means that uh, Stan Sipka takes a win with his, with his Fatigue Warrior. Mm -hmm. And now he's left with um, Druid, right? Yep. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, Stan he's... Sipka will play against Patron. Yeah. And as we talked before, I'm still not sure if he plays the Harrison Jones at all. Uh, but we will probably know in a few seconds. Maybe we'll appear in the opening hand. Yeah, and this matchup, um, pretty much anyone that's watched Hearthstone regularly, you know, is probably sick to death of hearing about this matchup. You all guys, all of you guys know it, but for the few people in chat that don't understand this matchup, I'll explain it one more time. Basically, the Patron Warrior is just looking to generate patrons as early as possible because Druid yeah. struggles to deal with it. So you're essentially mulliganing for things like Death Spite, Grim Patron, and Inner Rage, as well as just your early minions just to play out to try and annoy the druid a little bit, just to have some sort of curve early. Uh, looks like uh, Cowdy chose to mulligan fully for the Grim Patron dream there. Even I, I think he kept the death spite. Yeah, I mean, he kept the death spite, but he could have also chose to keep the frothing berserker just as a thing to play on turn three, which is a viable thing to do against druid because frothing berserkers aren't your win condition in this matchup. Grim Patrons are, so you can afford to play frothing berserkers to fight for the board. But with the death spite, he decided to just mulligan his entire hand for the inner rage and the, and the Grim Patron that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tom would actually play the Tempo Frontnick Berserkers in this matchup, and I don't ex um, I mean, it's kind of okay to play Tempo Frontnick Berserkers in this matchup. Yeah, I agree. Um, but he did get the Frothing Berserker back into his hand. We're going to see Coin Darnassus Aspirant come out here from Sithka, and unless there's a Fiery War Axe, this will let him curve nicely into his Shade of Naxxramas next turn. I, I like the play of the Darnassus Aspirant on turn 2 because most of the warriors are cutting one of your war eggs, but so there's less and less options of killing the Darnassus. Yeah, absolutely. And first shade comes down here. Second, wow. Second shade is a nice pickup to go along with it, but if the Acolyte comes down, we will just see the Keeper come down to, de to deny all value out of this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You keep the curve, which is nice. Yep. And you deny the card, which is even more important. You don't just ignore the minion, just go for the face mm -hmm. with the Dance's Aspirant, wait with the Shade of Extremis because it's virtually unkillable when it's being uh, still under stealth against patrons. And uh, yeah, just kill him with the, with the Savage Roars you will draw at some point of the game and, this, um, and those Shades. One hundred percent. Looks like the play this turn. Uh, it will get challenged directly by the Death Bite, and you do if you choose not to trade with the Acolyte. Ooh, is he silencing his own Aspirant? Whoa! I didn't see that at all. Whoa! I mean, the plays. But would you do that? I mean, this the the Shade of an Exorcist has such huge value in this matchup. Right. So it's yeah, almost like unkillable. Our reaction here, guys, like, we're well aware that's a thing you can do, all right? Silencing your own Darnus' Aspirant, we're aware that's a play. But what he just did is Maybe. value one of his own mana and exposing his shade over um, denying a card from his opponent. Which, mm -hmm. in Patron Warrior, denying them cards is one of the best things you can do. And maintaining pressure on the board is also one of the best things you can do. And the be almost the best pressure you can have in this min in this matchup is just an ever-growing stealth shade of Naxxramas. Um, yeah, because it basically deals one damage per turn. Yes, exactly. Um, so your opponent is just on an ever-ticking clock. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting line of play here. Because it's not like he needs to protect his curve for a 5-drop next turn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as we spoke about spoke about before, he is quite likely to draw a 5, because there are a lot of them in the deck. And, yep. and Well, he didn't, but he still has a Shade and Hero Power. Yep. Um, so like, it's worked out okay for him, and it protects his ramp into what is quite a slow hand, which might have been his thinking. Like, he has multiple 7s in his hand already, he's just drawn another 7. So he's probably quite pleased that he's kept that ramp, but 
still um pretty big talking point of the game there the choice to uh to silence your own dinosaur's aspirant over silencing the acolyte of pain mm -hmm. and carly is digging for those cards he needs one what does he need hmm well, patrons, that's he, it. Yeah, he needs patrons. He has Death Bite, he has Inner Rage, so um, as soon as he picks up the Grim Patron, he can start to address this board. Um, two swings of the Death Bite plus the Execute that he has will be enough to swing himself back onto the board in terms of tempo, and then the, the Grim Patron, if he draws it, will then just give him a, an overwhelming board advantage, especially as we see uh, Stan Sifka this turn just completely bricking on his draws and just has nothing to play this turn. Hmm. That's really awkward. Would you go with the um, Wild Growth anyway? Um, you can play a 7 next turn anyway. Um, is the difference between 7 and 8 really that big at this point? I don't think so. I mean, so. It, the Savage draw, draw would be big because you can um, you can combo the 1 turn earlier. Right, that's true. So you can set up lethal. Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, and I guess with two Ancient of Laws in your in your hand, what's the point in holding on to a Wild Growth to cycle, right? So. Yeah, and uh, bigger ch now we have big chances to draw that Savage Roar to level with uh, that one Shade of next round as you still have on the board. Yep, makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, I think um, you have to go down the, the Death Bite line here and just hope, you know, you have a couple of turns still to pick up your Patron. And in the meantime, you can use the Death Bite to fight for this board so that it's not just, you know, overwhelming to the point where developing patrons isn't enough when you draw them. Um, but he has a lot of concerns here. He needs to draw cards to get to the patron. He also needs to gain life to not just eventually die to combo. Mm -hmm. um, and he also needs to address the state of the board. Um, and unfortunately, there's just... Um, it's just not enough time to do all of those things. So he is going to choose to address the board state here, but also sneaks in the slam to get one card deeper in his deck, which I do like. That's true. And now we'll just probably just see the Angel of Law being slammed down. I don't think the Dr. Boom is much better than the Angel of Law in this situation. Because you practically want your opponent to use the Death Spider on the minion. Mm. And you want to dig for that Savage Roar. Because the Savage Roar is winning you the game instantly. Yep. And Dr. Boom doesn't necessarily guarantee that. And you deny yourself um, three chances of drawing the Savage Roar. I mean, uh, sorry, two chances of, of drawing the Savage Roar. It's a close call because the bombs are doing damage too. And, okay, another thing is Dr. Boom on turn... Before, before turn eight from your opponent is better. Then Doctor Boom, on the turn when you when you can just and when he can just follow it up with a Warson Commander Patrons. Mm -hmm. But I like the Angel of Law. Whoa, okay, there is the Patron, and we do see that he's whiffed on the Savage Roar, so he mm -hmm. does. No, he doesn't, does he? Yeah, no, he will. Well, he can go down to Armor 10, Smith back up to twelve. Oh yeah, Armor Smith will gain him more armor. That's yeah. right. Armor Smith, the patron, inner rage patron, attack. Yeah. Into the Ancient of Law spawn two patrons get four armor. Yeah, four armor. That's it. So you will be still at mm, fourteen. I mean, not still, but at fourteen. Yeah, and obviously fourteen isn't the number you want to be at, but at least that way you are playing around one card right you're playing around force of nature or savage rule you know you're making him have both if you don't choose to gain armor this turn and you just sit at 10 or 12 then suddenly um you know you do just die to force of nature for example because the shade will grow to 5 5 so at 12 to 12 health then you will just die to one single combo piece um or is, mm -hmm. he, is he gonna go with the unstable? no here okay. does go with the armor look like he picked up the um the unstable goal there at first, but he's going to go with your play, Lothar. This is the most life he can gain. And oh, That's actually, an easy play. Actually, going to end up at 15, right? Oh, you're right, because he. I forgot about the inner rage. The inner rage gets yeah. one armor as well. Yeah. So suddenly, as long as he's not dead, the druid, uh, sorry, the patron warrior is in a pretty comfortable position. Um, swipe. Not enough mana, and the. I mean, the swipe gaining him armor wouldn't matter anyway, because you can just swipe last. 
Um, and then if they're dead, it doesn't matter if they're gaining armor afterwards. The armor doesn't just bring them back to life. Um, but doesn't have enough mana to, to force of nature and swipe, so not quite lethal. Well, I'm thinking about Rev, the armor smith, Ancient of Law. You desperately need that Savage Roar. Yeah. If you go for the swipe play, mm -hmm. you give him a lot of armor, that's first of all. Yep. Hmm. He's, he's gonna I don't go dislike this, but yeah, maybe that's yeah. But the safest play play um, might be the best one here. I think oh, it's wow. okay as well because his hand is pretty. Apart from the two force of natures, you know, he has ancient of law, lower third doctor boom in his hand, so he's prepared for this game to to keep going. He doesn't need to kill him immediately. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't mind the activating the long game play here and just clearing the patrons off the board and, and asking the patron warrior to come up with something else. But suddenly the uh, the burst option is uh, is disappearing from from Sifka's bag of tricks because all of a sudden we're back up to twenty four and we still have the attacks on the board to make to gain even more armor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And clear the second trade of next dramas, which is a big deal. Yep. Now the um, Dr. Boom has less and less value because it's uh, already turn 8 and if there will be a second Patron Warzone Commander that allows it to regain control of the board and probably not that anyway because you know that there is no combo. Yep. Hmm. Interest... Wait, what? Will he play a one stable goal on this board? Can I play Unstable Ghoul and... And execute in this situation? Probably, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Yep. Um... Makes sense because you set up for Patron next turn. Sure. Yep. So he can uh, waltz on Patron now next turn if there's no removal for the Unstable Ghoul. We do see a Wrath in uh, Sifka's hand, which he can play alongside pretty much anything he wants. It does prevent him from doing the double five drop play. Normally double five drops on turn 10 is a hugely powerful thing that Druids love doing, but... Uh, I think you have to respect the whirlwind effects in the patron deck and just wrath this thing down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so at this point, still lacking the savage roar. Yeah, at this point, do you value Doctor Boom on the board more because you know just fishing for the savage roar isn't enough anymore? Do you value just having the bigger body and the boom bots on the board, or are you scared of uh, something like Warsong Patron happening on your boom bots? I think you should dig for cards. The, okay. the Doctor Boom is nice, but it allows you, like, it allows basically your opponent just to gain more patrons by default. Yeah. With no cards at all in his hand, and that's not something you want to do because you have no no second clear. Oh, look at it. That's yeah, savage draw. Savage draw. All right. Uh... So next turn, Azure Drake and Blow Tip, right? Just to dig for that innervate. Because you want to double uh, to, to increase the damage potential each turn. Mm. Hope out Shredder instead of. I should... Wait, what am I talking about? Yeah, no, uh, 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 sorry, sorry. I was mistaken. I um, so, yeah, Emperor seems like the simple play here. You are now threatening the kill back the other way. This is a pretty nice looking Emperor hand. It's lacking probably um, you know, something like an Inner Rage or a Whirlwind. Obviously, the Inner Rage doesn't matter for getting discounted, but it's something that you'd like to have in your hand at this point. Um, See, you are was, threatening the kill just back the other way. Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> you knew what you were talking about. Arthur. Yeah, I knew I knew. Yep. Profit. Um, so the Lord of has to get, uh, get down right now. The I mean, that has to get down. <laughs> Are we watching Paladin all of a sudden? Um, yeah. I like that. I Aggressive like stance. Yeah. Ooh. We're ignoring yeah, I mean, the Emperor. It Thor. doesn't necessarily. Um, trading with the Emperor doesn't do anything good for the Druid player. Because you you know, your, your clock is ticking. Mm -hmm. And one tick from the Emperor already made a huge difference. Yep. So playing this aggressive stance like that means your opponent has to be on the clock and he will trade with the Emperor. Yep. So I really like that. Saves 5 damage. I mean, not saves. It actually adds 5 damage. Sure. So I really like that. Really like that. Uh, so we're going to see a board clear turn here from uh, Cowdy. Can he get the board clear? Not quite, right? 
And it's not lethal, right? Because you have only one. It's not, it's not lethal. There's yeah. no there's no way this is lethal. Uh, only one whirlwind effect. The second one is <laughs> at five mana in your hand. So you get six from patrons, five from the emperor. So that's 11. So the frothing would need to do 17. And this frothing definitely does not do 17. But you lose, you lose your patrons if you want to clear this board. Yeah. And that's something that you don't want to do. Well, you lose your frothing berserker if you want to clear this board. Or your emperor, right? So Yeah, emperor is better because you yeah, need Yeah, you, you need to bank the 15 to face. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, actually two damage missed. Yep. He was worried about roping, so he f he queued up first the frothing berserker instead of uh instead of the emperor. Yeah, I mean sometimes when you're playing patron, it's most important just to get the turn done. Um, you know, sometimes you do have to excuse minor mistakes like that when the rope comes down because with all the animations going off, the most important thing is just to get some semblance of the right turn done. And sometimes little concerns like uh, the ordering with frothing berserkers and, and making optimal trades with like using a, a, a two health patron instead of a three health patron and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. so, sometimes it does go a little wrong. Um, but yeah, Cowdy's just going to swing for the fences here and uh, hope to top deck the second frothing berserker. Yeah, because that's his last win condition. Does left. he have? Does he have one left? No, he drew one early, right? Or is that still the same one that's been in his I hand? I think that was the same game? one. Okay. Because it was far to the left in the in the hand. Okay. And Stan Sifko will just slam down the Belcher because he's w one of lethal right now. So I guess the Belcher has to come down. Yep, seems legit. Uh, and he's gonna, he's gonna skip playing a second minion, or is he gonna put down the aspirant here as well? I don't think so. He doesn't. No. He doesn't need the second minion. Yep, agree. Uh, and that's it, basically. Yep, that's not good enough. Cowdy needed his frothing berserker that turn. Even then, can he push through? The problem with the Belcher being played after the death, uh, death rattle of the um, death spite. Mm -hmm. Uh, means that you cannot execute uh, the little slime after you attack with the death spite. Right. The, death rattle, the trigger of the death rattle will be first after yep. before the spawn of the slime, so you don't have an option to go through the taunt before you attack with the frothing berserker. So even a frothing berserker draw uh, draw this turn it wouldn't have wouldn't guarantee so. anything. Yeah. So he, he'd need to have inner rage executed the taunt, and obviously inner rage was the card he drew this turn. So if he'd have drawn yeah. the frothing berserker, he wouldn't have had it. So yeah, even the frothing berserker wouldn't have won the game. <laughs> it would be really hilarious to see it other way around, like first Belcher, then Death, Death, Death Spite, right? Yeah. But then you, but then you couldn't attack for, for the first time. <laughs> so no, never mind. That's not possible. Right. You Unless you hit another million. Yeah. And that's, that's GG. It's gonna be the game. Stan Sitka advances to the semifinals, and he will be facing RDU. And how do you is sporting patron patron too? Interesting. Yep. I would really like to see how this um, semi-final um, will pan out for both of these players. So we know. Uh, congratulations to Sansevka. Uh, he kind of summons his. Um, uh, I would say like he's not that known in the Hearthstone scene yet, but he's a, almost a legend in Magic: The Gathering. And Absolutely, yeah. Like him seeing he uh, he seeing his quality of play. In Hearthstone, I, I hope to just tament his, um, like you know, stands on the board. I mean, his place on, on this on the scene. So, and so, congratulations again for the San Sivka. We have both semifinals already um, in our brackets. You can check those by typing exclamation mark bracket, and then you will get a link to the abusgaming.com. And the, the next semifinal we'll see is the. Mirror match between Archon members. Maybe not mirror match, but yeah, you get my the, point. Yeah, the team kill game between the, the two Archon game. members remaining. So we have our, our semi final lineup uh, fully ready to go. So the first semi final, I believe, that we will see will be Orange versus Firebat, and then we will follow mm -hmm. that up very shortly with RDU versus Stan Sifka. Yes, and, and now we'll be jumping through a quick commercial, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere.